Hey guys, today we're gonna mix things up a little bit because I'm gonna talk about antique cults. Okay, I tried this once before and it actually turned out pretty well. I did a video on single action armies and I started off by saying, listen, I don't know very much about these. If you watch my channel regularly, and you should, I mostly know about Walthers and Lugers, a little bit about 1911 war era cults, but I don't collect, I have never bought a antique cult. So I got a collection and this is probably, this video is about a year old. Um, and I say, I do this with fear and trepidation because even when I know what I'm talking about, people write snide remarks about how stupid I am or I'm wrong and how can you call yourself an expert? I'm not an expert. In fact, a lot of you out there know a lot more. And so I'm gonna be asking for your input, but here's what happens. I get guns in, I take in a collection. They're usually on consignment because as I said, I don't buy them because I don't know what the value is. And I often don't know what model or make, etc. Actually, I can tell the make when it says Colt, I pretty much know it's a Colt. So in the last video, it was just a collection that somebody sent us and said, would you help me sell my collection of antique Colts? And we said, sure. And I view it as a great opportunity to show you some new content and something different than the ordinary. And that, by the way, turned out great. People wrote respectful comments. I loved it. People helped us out. They helped us with uh, descriptions. They corrected some of the things I said, and we even got help with pricing and sold them all. That's what we want to do. So that happened again. We just got in a collection of antique cults. Uh, actually, a few of them sold already because when people heard, people close by drove over and helped us price them. So we sold some of them already, but this is a great opportunity to see some very rare cults that you probably hardly see either replicas or second generation, third generation. These are all original antique cults. Uh, so we're gonna take a look. Before I do that, I wanna do a thank you to Ian McCollum at Forgotten Weapons because I watched a couple of his videos. They were very helpful. And then also Othias at CN Arsenal. He did a over an hour long video on uh, many of the cults that I'm gonna be talking about. So if I make a mistake, you can blame them. So in the comments section, I'm actually gonna ask questions like I'm not sure about which variation it is. Would love to hear from you. And then we can all read the comments and learn from each other. I think you're gonna enjoy this. Let's go take a look. Okay, I have these in order of a progression in terms of years. Um, and all of these are antique cults except for this one, which is a flintlock. And it's the only flintlock on here. These are percussion or cap and ball, and these are cartridge down here. Um, but there's only one in the collection that looks like this. And this is flintlock. And it looks too good to be true, meaning it looks brand new. In fact, it reminds me of when you go to Valley Forge, go to the museum and they'll have replica flintlocks. Uh, this is an original uh, flintlock, but it was reconverted. Now, reconverted means it was Jewish, became a Christian, and then went back to Judaism. Okay, I'm lying. <laughs> Just getting you ready for April 1st. Um, but this flintlock was reconverted, meaning uh, it came out originally as a flintlock. And by the way, it's a model 1836. 1836, and it's dated 1843. So it was originally a flintlock. It is martially marked. Uh, you can see the U.S. right here. U.S. And here you can also see U.S. and the inspector stamp, J.H., a P, which is a common proof for military guns. And there's a cartouche there for the inspector. This was made by Johnson. So when the cartridges came out for the martially owned guns, military guns came out with the cap and ball, excuse me, not cartridge, came out with cap and ball. This was converted to cap and ball. Once these were obsolete because they moved on to cartridges, then these were sold off. And I would imagine at some point, uh, antique gun collectors uh, bought these up in bulk from the US government and they reconverted them back to their original configuration, which is flintlock. Flintlock goes in here. You put your powder right there, push this down, and then of course when the flintlock hits, it sparks. Uh, we actually showed that on one of the shorts where the flintlock would spark, ignite the powder, and 
fire the ball. This is the rod and this pulls out and it works on a lever. So you can put that down. The, oh, you'd put it down this way. It's very confusing. There we go. I got it. Uh, put it down that way and jam it down there, uh, the, the ball. And that is a Johnson model 1836. Now we will enter the Colt era. Uh, now Samuel Colt, uh, his first business he started in Hartford, Connecticut. Samuel Colt's first revolver, and by the way, there were uh, revolvers that were made in Europe. Uh, so many of those are in museums that you can look them up. But the first mass-produced revolving uh, pistol was the Patterson. And that business was in Hartford, Connecticut. Samuel Colt uh, did the design and the business went bankrupt. It didn't work out real well. I think they sold uh, several thousand Patterson pistols, but they had some, some flaws, some design uh, problems. And so he went bankrupt. And then later, with the help of uh, Walker, he, he started making Colts again, revolving Colts called the Colt Walker. Uh, they only made about a thousand of those. Those were a little bit too powerful. Here's a picture of one, but the cylinder is even larger. And I think they said, uh, I think it was Ian that said the, the grains of powder was like 60, which would be the equivalent to an elephant rifle. So they made about a thousand. The Texas Rangers loved them. And by the way, the scene on this, you're not gonna be able to see it, but the scene on this, uh, we're all stamped onto here, is uh, Texas Rangers fighting the Indians, and that's the early model. Uh, this is not a walker. Um, the, this is the improvement on the walker. So again, a thousand walkers. Uh, the Texas Rangers loved them, but they had uh, they were too powerful where they had some cracking and splitting on the cylinders. There were a few problems, and again, I, I'm not I'm not claiming to be an expert on what went wrong. All I know is then they went to the Dragoon, and believe it or not, this is so heavy and so. <laughs> Um, it seems so powerful. It's a 44 caliber, uh, but this was a downgrade from the Walker, and this was a lot more successful. This is a variation one, and the way we know variation one is because it has uh, this, these holes are an oval. That's not the only change, but a variation one has the oval. It also has the square back trigger guard, so square back trigger guard, little ovals. You can see on this one, they became rectangular. Uh, this is a first variation Dragoon. This Dragoon has almost no finish left. We just sold one off the site uh, for about 14,000. You'll see um, prices all over the place, I think uh, generally between uh, 10,000 and 15,000. By the way, this is fairly cheap. It's falling apart. Uh, this is fairly cheap. Uh, these are uh, somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000. Uh, they're just good looking examples. These obviously are a lot more expensive. It, by the way, it's in 44 caliber. So I find this to be pretty cumbersome. And then later the military went with a smaller sidearm, which would be the 1851 Navy model. And that's in 36 caliber. And then the 1860 Army model in 44 caliber. So this is in 44 caliber. It's percussion, so the cap and ball. It has the ramrod and everything is numbered and matching except for the wedge on this one I think is blank. Usually the, that will be matching. And you can see here, there's a serial number here. There's a serial number here here and here. And most of these that were made, there were uh, tens of thousands of these made. Most of them went to the US military and that US stamp right there uh, means it went to the military and some were commercially sold as well. Now, speaking of commercial sales, because of the success of the Dragoon, Colt decided let's sell some to the commercial market. And so this is considered a baby Dragoon. Now notice it has the squared off uh, trigger guard. There is no ramrod here. Here you see the ramrod. Uh, for the smaller version, the way to reload it is not using the ramrod. You just pop the wedge out, the cylinder comes out, you load it that way, put the cap on it, and it fires. You can see the timing on it. It fires like that. Now this is a later version. You can see the rectangular holes here instead of the ovals. 
Uh, that's actually an improvement. Besides the little holes there, there are other improvements that Othias actually does a really good job about how this has a role on it. And he also mentions that these were originally silver over brass and the silver wears off. Uh, but again, I'm just um, w taking what other people have said. Oh, the other difference I wanted to mention was this has the stagecoach scene. Now, you can't see it at all because it's pretty well corroded. But uh, this has the stagecoach scene. They made about 14,000, uh, actually 14,500 of these. And this is number 13,800. So it's toward the end of the production of the Baby Dragoon. Now, I see these anywhere from three to 6,000. And that's usually based on the condition. This one uh, has corrosion and almost no finish at all. We have some better looking ones here. This is also known as a model 1848. Now, the one that's more common that we see is um, a model 1849, uh, and this is just considered a pocket pistol. So this is a Colt pocket pistol. This is in much better condition. You can see some finish here. There's no silver. Well, maybe there might be some silver there. Maybe that's, uh, that's tarnished silver, but Again, quoting others, I'm not an expert. You can comment. Uh, these were silver plated and the silver wore off. Um, but on this one, you can see the stagecoach scene. Well, at least you can see the wheels, but there's a stagecoach scene here. You do see the Colt Patton. You do see the stagecoach scene here. If you have cock it, then you can easily move this move the cylinder. And again, and again, uh, you can see that it's numbered similar. Uh, there's serial number, serial number, serial number, and serial number. Again, pocket pistol went to the public. These were very popular. You can see some case hardening here. And um, just the condition is, is a, a lot better. By the way, all of these pocket pistols, including the Baby Dragoon, come in 31 caliber. See the size of the hole there compared to the 44 caliber. Okay, um, now quickly, this, this is the rest of the pocket pistols. And they, they are in the anywhere from... 2,500 to 3,500. I believe the Dragoon is a little bit more. And again, I, I feel free to comment. I know you're all going to say this is worth 20 bucks and I'll send it to you in the mail immediately. But I, I think 25 to 35 from what I see online. Um, but the Baby Dragoon is a little bit, is a little more because it's a little earlier. Now remember, this is in the 13,000 range. There's a couple things that I don't understand and you can help me with it. I think I figured this one out. So I went to this one and I thought, okay, this looks like a baby dragoon. And notice, by the way, the different lengths. I think there's like a, a three inch, a four inch, a six inch, maybe seven inch. Uh, you can order them in any sizes. I mean, Colt was like Burger King. Any way you want it, they would, they would uh, make it for you. Uh, but let's go back to this. This one confused me for a little bit, especially being a novice, because I saw serial number 95. So I thought serial number 95 has to be a baby dragoon, and yet it doesn't have the square back. And some of you know right away, because what I see in the cylinder, this was a baby dragoon that was converted. That's my assessment. You can tell me if I'm wrong. But number 95 would have been a baby dragoon. It was converted, meaning see the cylinder? Notice the, uh, the nipple, I, can I say that on, on camera? The nipple here is missing because they went from cap and ball, no more cap, and this was converted to a cartridge. You can see here, there's the firing pin for the cartridge. So, so basically they took a Dragoon, they upgraded it also. It was cut for a, a cleaning rod and I'm not sure why that's not there but that's not there. Okay, so I'd love to hear your comments on this. It is 31 caliber, the rod is gone, and it was converted to a, um, a cartridge. So feel free to send me your comments if you can tell more about this. Actually, this says 36 caliber, and these, I think, were supposed to all be 31 caliber. 
It definitely looks like 36 cal caliber. So when it was converted to cartridge, they changed the caliber. They would have changed uh, this trigger guard. The rod is no longer there, but it must have been there at one point. Well, actually, they don't need the rod anymore because now it's cut to put the cartridge. You can see here it's cut so you can get the cartridge in. So this is a conversion, probably sells for a little bit because it's been altered, but the fact that it's number 95 actually is pretty cool. Okay, I was gonna show you this one next because this one I'm, I'm not 100% sure about, but uh, if I mentioned the barrel lengths, this is six inch, four inch, and this one is going to be three inch. So uh, you can see the different barrel sizes, but the thing about this one that confused me a little bit, I don't think it's a baby Dragoon because it's, um, it's not square back, but on the large Dragoon, the third variation does have a rounded trigger guard. This has a rounder, rounded trigger guard. It has no rod, never had the, um, the rod, the ramrod. And the serial number is about 15,000. So I think this is a pocket pistol, uh, but it does look an awful lot like a Dragoon. The other difference is, and this is important, Othias talks about this quite a bit, the space between the cylinder and the barrel on the Dragoon is very, very small, very little space. Here, there's a lot more space. So I believe this is a pocket pistol. This one is also 15,000. And so I'm thinking this is a, a pocket pistol. Not, not squared, it's more rounded, no rod. I've already mentioned this one. And then this one, which the, with a three inch barrel is in the 100,000 100, serial range. So they made hundreds of thousands of these. I think I, I saw that was like a couple hundred thousand. This has the stagecoach scene on the cylinder. Uh, but let's move along in the military models. None of these are military. This, this was uh, early military. This was even earlier military. But now let's take a look at the uh, cavalry officer's pistol. Uh, you can see that it went to the military. There's a US mark. And we're no longer cap and ball because now we have a pin that's hitting a cartridge. I wish I had some cartridges to show you. They also had the loading lever, which by the way, the number on the loading lever does not match the numbers on the gun. Uh, and it's always that way. It's, it's more of a production number. Uh, so th this lever almost always matches. We tell somebody it's all matching. They get it home and they say, you lied. Uh, these are supposed to be matching. The loading lever is not matching. This comes in 44 caliber. It has almost no finish to it. Uh, you can see the length of the barrel, which is about uh, seven and a half inches. Might be eight inches, but it's actually got a slightly longer barrel than even the Dragoon. But look at the size in the cylinders. There's a big difference. So this is a military pistol, uh, and it is all matching numbers. It also has uh, the inspection proof DFC. So besides the matching serial numbers and the US marking here, you also want to look for the inspector, which is, this is a fairly desirable inspector. The first one I know is Ainsworth, and we'll have an A here. Uh, those sell for the most money. These are also very early. DFC is David F. Clark. And a serial number here as well. You can still see the little trigger which I, I think is kind of funny compared to today's guns. All these early guns have a very little trigger. When we get to the double action in a little bit, we'll see the triggers get a little bit bigger. Um, but also over here, you have the date, you have the cartouche, and DFC underneath. So DFC here, inspector proof, cartouche, and this says 1880. Now I have one other cavalry. It's not cavalry, that's a whole different thing but some people mistakenly say cavalry. It's cavalry. Uh, this one is also DFC. You may not be able to see it, but DFC, all matching numbers. And so the cavalry uh, example, 44 caliber with a seven or eight inch barrel. Uh, it's US marked. 
Uh, these are very desirable guns. These are often found in the $6,500 to up to $10,000. Again, there's not a lot of finish on this. The more finish you have, it obviously goes up exponentially. So for example, I believe this one, we are gonna be selling for about 7,500. And this other one is about the same. Next, these next three are all artilleries. Now the artilleries were sent back and they were reworked and therefore the artillery Colts always have mismatched parts. So here we have num uh, mismatch number for here and here. Uh, when we put these into the logbook, we always use the serial number on the frame or if we want to date it, we use the serial number on the frame. But this model, shorter barrel, and you can see 45 caliber Colt. So I'm sure this is 45 caliber Colt. I'm pretty sure this is 44 caliber, but I could be wrong. So with this, you see the US and 45 caliber. And here you can see the loading lever. Uh, this is not numbered, but if they are, they're not gonna match. Well, none of these, none of these numbers are gonna match. Uh, this price range is, again, about 7500 but on this, you can see a lot more finish, case hardening. This is extremely desirable. Somebody's going to want to grab this because they almost never come, or you can see the case hardening still. Uh, and I already mentioned the D DFC. You can see that on the bottom, on one of the, one of the panels, you can see it at the bottom, and that's pretty much standard. I see it on one, but not both. And then often you'll have a cartouche here. Often that gets worn off because it was struck pretty lightly. And I don't see one here, but they often will have the cartouche. This is just a beautiful gun. Here's the action on it. You can see it's very tight. And you listen for the clicks. I think these have four clicks. I think you can hear four. Four. Here are the other two. I, I just love these guns. Again, people who collect these, they wait a long time to see one like this. Look at the bluing on here. Uh, case hardening here, but not so much down here. Again, 45 caliber. And I believe that's a six inch barrel. And this barrel is about five and a half inches. I guess they're all about the same. Artillery models, again, not matching. You might be able to see the serial numbers a little better here. You see this serial number doesn't match this serial number and doesn't match this serial number. So they are mismatched and they are supposed to be. Now, did an artillery model ever come all matching? I actually saw one that was all matching. I did talk to experts, that's in quotes, that said they're never matching and other people say very rarely you will see them matching. This one has the DFC and also here DFC. This one I don't see an inspector proof but underneath the serial number there is a letter and under here you can see a cartouche and a date that I think is 1902 and I see RAC here, Ronaldo Carr, I wanna say, RAC here, so this is a later inspector from the DFC. Um, but again, two beautiful artilleries, and in this condition, they can be $65 to $7,500. Now, I, I have two more guns just for fun. Uh, this one, this I believe is uh, original nickel, and it is, uh, one of the early double actions. There was the Colt Lightning that came out first and then the Colt Thunder, uh, double action, 40, uh, 41 caliber, not to the military, original nickel, Colt, and here it says 31 caliber. Beautiful gun, and here's how the action goes. I don't wanna slam it, so I'm gonna catch it. It'll work like this. You can see the, the, fire, the pin to fire the cartridge. You can see the loading lever, not numbered that I can see. And you still have the rod and that's double action. You can shoot it like this, which is the way all of these shoot, single action. And this is one of the early double actions. So that's a beautiful gun. And this, uh, because it's a nickel finish, original nickel finish, this is gonna be 
uh, between $2,500 and $3,000. And then finally, we have this beautiful Colt Frontier Six Shooter. Now, before you get all a gaga on me, uh, this has been for professionally restored. Absolutely beautiful. Look at the case hardening. Uh, it is a single action. It is all matching and it is first gen. So it's first generation. Uh, so it wasn't made later. Now I do need to get a factory letter to uh, say that this was etched. This is barrel etched and would be a very expensive gun if it was all original. Very, very expensive, meaning fifteen to $20,000. But because it's been restored, and some people suggested it's Turnbull restoration, uh, we called Turnbull, and it is not, but it was done by somebody who did a great job. So this is uh, not U.S. Mark, so it's a commercial variety, and also the, U the Army would not have etched it. But that's just, I wanted to show you uh, a restored gun. We actually got two of these. And this says 44 caliber. So I see a lot that are either 45 or 44 caliber, uh, all matching. We'll take a look at, there's the lever. Now that is numbered and not matching. And here's the action. You can see how that works and it advances. I don't want to move the cylinder too much because there's hardly a scratch in it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure we'll hear four clicks on this as well. Definitely four. Great action, beautiful gun. And this is uh, probably going to be somewhere between four and five thousand dollars for a restored gun. But again, all original in pristine condition would be three times that. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today. I know I did when I was preparing for this video. And you know where is a good place to get some antique cults? That's right. In a couple weekends, first weekend in April, the Tulsa Gun Show. So if you can be there, stop on by our table. <music>